Hey everybody, Sean Sewell with Gimmit.com podcast. Really excited to have on for the second time now, Brad Kearns. Accomplished author, involved in the so many projects that I can't even get my head around it. We'll talk about as many of them as possible. And upcoming here in about next two or three weeks will be Two Meals a Day, a brand new book simplifying eating habits and not just eating habits, but lifestyle changes and journaling and a lot of really great, helpful things we can all benefit from. So welcome back to the show, Brad. Oh my gosh, what an honor to be on Engearment again, the smoothest voice in the whole podcast scene. So here we go. Well, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, Brad's got his own podcast called the B-Rad Podcast. It is fantastic. Um, most recently, uh, last week, you had uh, Rob Wolf on, who's, if you don't know who Rob Wolf is, please check him out. And actually, I drink his element almost every morning. It's good, salty, helps out with yeah. the it's just, incredible. I like the writing on the box that, you know, the, the packaging, because it says this stuff is salty as heck or whatever, and get ready. And um, boy, you realize how important electrolytes are. And now, as I learn more about it, I just started taking element two uh, in recent, recent times. But I think back when I first started keto, that an electrolyte imbalance was one of the things uh, strikes against me because I did kind of struggle a bit. And I remember having these crash and burn periods. I was blaming them on uh, my workouts being too stressful, which I'm sure they were. And I've modified those. Maybe we'll even get into that topic. But um, I think I was, you know, not taking in enough sodium, potassium, magnesium, especially with when that dietary transition occurs and you lose some of those foods uh, because you're, you're cutting back on uh, all carbohydrate intake. So yeah, those guys have a great thing going at Element. Luis Villasenor and Tyler Cartwright, also the co-founders and the guys behind Keto Gains, and they do such amazing work uh, helping people lose weight and get fit all types of people. So plugs out to all the people in our space doing great work, especially Rob Wolf. And we were talking just before we hit record that I was so inspired after that show because he is such a badass and he shoots straight and he doesn't pull any punches. And when stuff's wrong and flawed and destructive and it's, you know, marketing hype and manipulation, Rob Wolf is going to call it out. So I really appreciate people who are not afraid to speak up and lead that healthy rebellion, which is what his podcast and his whole movement is called, because we need it. We're fighting against a massive uh, force of, you know, the, the corporate forces and the conventional wisdom uh, the, the government recommendations for, for eating that we've followed for uh, several decades that have been disastrous to human health. And it's time to unwind all these things and, you know, seek the truth with relentless uh, passion and aggression, really. Oh, I dig it. I took away a lot of notes from that episode, too. And like you mentioned before we push record about um, taking a stand, you know, um, not always being nice about things and being honest about stuff. I liked that he was quick to call, call out quite a few things, and that was very uh, refreshing to hear. And um, more, more power to him. It's awesome. Yeah, and then on a on a, a follow up note, it's also true that people have a very difficult time changing their mind and opening up to new ideas and concepts that might challenge their fixed and rigid beliefs. Because we like to formulate and hold on to fixed and rigid beliefs throughout our life. It gives us a sense of comfort and certainty and all those things. So uh, I, I probably made the mistake in the past of being overly enthusiastic about my incredible recommendations for health and fitness and athletic training principles to people who weren't uh, open and receptive to the message. And so you have to be really careful with, um, you know, how you communicate and, you know, determine whether you're just, uh, you know, burning, un burning up a bunch of air and wasting your time versus engaging in real dialogue. And um, boy, I've had to, you know, challenge this myself in recent years with the uh, arrival of the carnivore movement. And when I first listened to uh, Dr. Saladino and Dr. Baker and uh, Michaela Peterson, Amber O'Hearn, the leaders, it was, uh, you know, a direct challenge to a lot of fixed and rigid beliefs that I'd formed and written about for years that vegetables are the centerpiece of a healthy diet because they have so many micronutrients and all these great things. And then here's some people saying, hey, yeah, you know, this stuff might actually rip up your stomach. And that, that green smoothie I'm drinking every single morning with a big piles of raw spinach and kale and celery and beets and the super nutrition food of the world, um, I also had a blown up stomach for several hours every time I drank this green smoothie. And 
you know, I thought, okay, well, that's a hassle and uh, whatever. It, it always goes away after a few hours. Uh, but I was uh, sharing that insight with my friend who's also a real uh, healthy, fit guy and uh, seeking, you know, the, the highest optimizations all the time. And so he was on the smoothie train also. And he goes, yeah, you know what? It blows up my stomach too, but it's so healthy that it's worth it. And his comment like froze me in my tracks because I'm like, wait a second, you know, something doesn't make sense here because if something is truly healthy for you, it shouldn't cause you, uh, you know, severe intestinal bloating when you consume it. And then here I have uh, people to listen to that are explaining it out and saying, yeah, this is what's going on. And probably a lot of people are suffering that don't know about it. And so I had to lay down, you know, I had to depart from my train tracks that I'd been on for so long and say, yeah, maybe it's worth some experimenting and some uh, recalibrating and reprogramming of what I consider to be a healthy diet. And I think I know it all because I've been studying and living and breathing this stuff every day. But man, it, it's good to get knocked off your knock off your track once in a while and then gather up the pieces and say, okay, let's, you know, let's proceed with an open mind and strive to keep that mind open at all times. Oh, I dig it. It's true. I like getting humbled quite a bit too. And good for you for being open and being able to talk about that as well. Um, and as Dr. Paul uh, Saladini mentioned, uh, very much an advocate for <laughs> meat-based uh, eating. Yeah, and you know what, Sean? Honestly, since that day in uh, May of 2019, when I listened to Paul talk with Ben Greenfield, and you can go back and listen to that first show uh, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show, and to, to you know Ben, who I respect so much, and I think you know, Paul really uh, made a huge impact on Ben's mindset. And Ben's a guy that's not easily dis dissuaded or, you know, uh, played around with because he has an incredible knowledge base, probably uh, exceeding anyone that I've ever seen in this in this ancestral health scene. Uh, but since that day, uh, you know, my mind turned a corner. I mean, it, it actually blew my mind and my diet has changed uh, permanently. Uh, thanks to the insights provided by uh, the carnivore leaders. And so now I follow an animal-based diet. I know we talk about plant-based, and that means for some people, vegan, vegetarian. Others, it means, you know, trying to eat a ton of different plants. So I'm trying to eat a variety of different nutrient-dense animals. I created this beautiful chart. I'll put it in the, the links and you can have your audience get it really nicely. It's called the Carnivore Scores. And it's a ranking list of the world's most nutrient-dense foods with the top category, the second, the third, the fourth tier, the fifth tier, and all the, um, as far as plants, uh, the ones that are least offensive and most nutritious for those to introduce into the diet. Uh, but it's something that I'm pretty much representing how I eat today. And it's a huge difference from, you know, just a couple years ago when I was eating a salad as the centerpiece of my diet. Yeah, it had steak in it or salmon or whatever, but, you know, I was making these huge piles of stir fried vegetables in the name of health. And now I no longer go looking for plants in the name of health. I might eat them. I'm not super strict because I don't feel like I'm a highly sensitive uh, person to, you know, the plant toxins. Uh, but it's been a huge transition and something I, I never imagined would happen. I thought I was at the highest tier of knowledge and implementation and I'm, I'm, I'm dialed in. And now it's like, you know, I, I haven't had a salad in uh, a couple of years and it's, it's pretty wild to think about, you know, how we continue to have to grow and, and progress and test and retest. Oh, that's, that's awesome. You're right. It, we do evolve. And, and um, I appreciate that about you and about a lot of people you get to talk with about reevaluating what works, why it works, what might not work. Um, Speaking of working, I, I really admire your morning routine. Can you go over what that entails? It's, it seems to be growing. Yeah, thanks, man. That's one of my favorite topics. And I started this four years ago. I decided that uh, these sprint workouts that I was doing were really strenuous. They're really high quality. I loved them. They were great fitness boost, all that great stuff. But if you look at my weekly schedule, you can't do those very often. So I would do them in the manner of, you know, once every seven to 10 days. And after each one for a dozen years, I would count on three days of being really super sore, pretty darn tired, or I wouldn't really do many other workouts to speak of for a couple few days. My calves were so sore that I'd be limping around for the first 24 hours after these sprint workouts. And I realized that nothing compared came anywhere close to what I was putting my body through that one workout every seven to 10 days. 
So I wanted to think of a way to like be better prepared for these big slams, these big, you know, peak performance workouts, but have some sort of adaptability so that they weren't like this incredible, amazing, you know, it's like going out and running 30 miles uh, once a month and then not jogging in between those runs. You know, it's not, not as easy as if you were kind of keeping a base going. So I decided to create this, you know, custom designed uh, morning stretching and strengthening routine. So I'm lying on the ground, scissoring my legs and doing the frog kicks and these things that work the core and help with hamstring and hip flexor uh, mobility. And it's really been life-changing for me because I'm not a consistency type of guy. I don't answer to anybody. So I'm not on a routine pattern where you can count on me driving to the office from 8.30 to 9 and working there and then out to lunch at my favorite place. I'm always doing something different. I'm based in the home. I'm working out at any time of day I want. I'm working on a different project depending on how I feel, right? I mean, you're on my podcast schedule. Oh my gosh, what a great way to frame the afternoon, but you you never know. But this is something that now I can count on that I start every single day in the same manner. And that is to immediately as soon as I get out of bed, I hit the deck and I commence my, my sequences. And it's a very deliberate and exact uh, protocol that I do every single day. And that's really important because I don't want to have to apply any creativity or willpower or think of ideas for today's workout. So it's immediately 40 hamstring scissor kicks to the right, 40 to the left, 20 frogs forward, 20 frogs backward, uh, leg swings each side, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going through this thing and I have to count everything out. And that means that I can't be distracted by, let's say, listening to a podcast or uh, talking or, or doing anything else, daydreaming. And so it becomes sort of a meditative experience because all I'm thinking about is the count. And, you know, the, the physical act of my body moving through space as soon as I wake up. And so that's kind of a cool aspect of it, too. So it's a, it's a repeated thing, and it puts me kind of in a trance. And uh, now I'm also kind of training my mind not to judge the physical effort, because some of the movements that I've included over time are pretty challenging. And so when you hold the, what do they call it? The wheel in yoga, you know, it's like you're making a St. Louis gateway arch with your body. So only your feet and your hands are on the ground and you hold that for a 40 count. It's pretty tough. I mean, your back is lit up from, from, you know, the neck down to the uh, tailbone. Uh, But you know, I used to dread that part of the routine, but now it's like, you don't have to judge your physical efforts as, as good or bad, or uh, put a, a characterization on them. Like, oh, my kettlebell workout is a real torture fest. You got to come try it with me sometime. And I think we're guilty of that in fitness where you can kind of apply some negative emotions to the experience and it doesn't serve uh, any purpose. And your, your muscles and your heart and your lungs are incapable of experiencing emotion. So they don't know what's, you know what's pain and suffering and what's not. And so that's kind of a fun thing too, is where I've, I've done this so, good, so often and I've become you know, more and more competent at it. So now it's like even the difficult stuff, I have no emotional response to it. I just do it. And it feels like a, a breakthrough in that sense too, where I'm becoming a more disciplined and focused and more resilient person to all forms of of stress and distraction and uh, physical discomfort that I might face over the course of the rest of the day. Wow, that's really great. I like that meditative because you're going through it and you're present, you're not distracted and you're counting. So I really appreciate that because one of my favorite activities to do is split boarding. And so it's one step, next step, one foot in front of the Mm, other. Right. Right. And next thing you know, you've done the hard work. Um, and you're at the top of the mountain or wherever you want to be. <laughs> right. The mountain will get there someday. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter uh, stressing about it, you know? Um, Jeremy Jones has a great line, the journey is the reward. Uh, mm. Just being um, in the meditative process. And it's great that you can get this done in the morning because then you're mobile and you're, you're pliable. And I've seen some of your videos on Instagram. And I have actually need to give you credit where credit is due because they've inspired me when I'm doing my group classes. We do a lot of calisthenics because not a lot of people have access to gym equipment or a gym at the moment, mm-hmm. obviously. So uh, we do a group Zoom classes and uh, oftentimes we'll bring in their spouses or their kids. And so I want to be palatable for everybody. So oftentimes we'll do like the one-legged hip hinge, which I've seen you do, or the air lunge, or um, stuff like that. They're they're great. They're body weight based. They're, they're, they're helpful for hiking, for skiing, for all mm-hmm. kinds. And uh, so, yeah, credit to you for inspiring me to get those back in the the programming. Thanks. Here's another thing I want to mention about this morning routine. Uh, I started out very gradually with a much less involved, much less difficult 
uh, system. And that was because I wanted to form that habit without it being too daunting or something that oh, I better blow it off today because I'm, I'm pretty busy. Uh, so the first routine started out and it was actually 12 minutes long and a lot of it was in bed. And I didn't realize like anything you do with core exercise, if you're sinking into a mattress, it's so much easier. And then one day for whatever reason, maybe because I didn't want to kick Mia more because she was still in bed, you know, I, I went to the deck and like, oh my gosh, my stomach was lit up. Like I thought I was in shape, but uh, so then I transitioned out of bed onto the ground to do proper core work. Uh, but from this initial 12 minute uh, commitment, mm -hmm. I very carefully and uh, deliberately added stuff over time that I thought would be cool to uh, introduce. But I had to do it in a manner that felt really comfortable for me and doable rather than overwhelming myself. And now I learned, I interviewed a great uh, brain training expert, best-selling author, John Asaraf. And he says, you know, the way most people fail is they set these giant goals and then they fall short and then they feel bad and they get discouraged and they quit. So if you can set a ridiculously easy lifestyle transformation goal, um, my daughter just told me, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, what I decided to do was I want to drink more water. And she has a whole bunch of other goals with healthy eating and getting fitter and all that. But her first one is a baby step forward. And if we can do that and execute and build some repetition and endurance to the habit, then that's when we're open to, you know, growth and in increasing our commitment. So, you know, I had this 12 minute thing going probably for the first year, and then maybe I added two different moves at the end. So now it's whatever, 15 minutes, 17 minutes. And today, the thing takes 35 minutes, a minimum. Uh, I have my new, you can, you can look on YouTube for Brad Kern's morning routine and you'll see the original one where I'm laying in bed. And then you'll see the one uh, Brad Kern's morning routine filmed in uh, late 2020. And it's vastly more involved and more difficult. And so that's been a really interesting uh, transition over time. And it's taught me so much about you know, how to actually stick to a habit and have it be automatic rather than a struggle. And so each, each step forward was a baby step. And now it's so involved that uh, by the time I finish, many days, I just choose to roll that right into a proper workout. So I might go and then hit some kettlebells or X3 bar stretch cords. And, you know, it came on the heels of this morning routine because I'm up and I'm flexible and mobile, like you said, and I'm ready for a workout as it happens. Or a lot of times I'm ready for opening up the laptop lid because the world's starting without me. And, uh, you know, it, it's still like a, a big chunk out of my morning that's, you know, makes requires a commitment. But I should make the contrast that uh, research by uh, this, this uh, IDC, they're called, I, I think, um, they, they did a survey and discovered that 84% of Americans do the same thing first thing in the morning. You know what it is? Check their phone. Reach for the phone. And as soon as you grab that mobile device, uh, the, the psychological experts that were quoted in this study that I read, um, you put your brain into reactive mode rather than ideally, especially first thing in the morning, you wanna be in that higher brain function, uh, reasoning, strat strategic thinking, problem solving, planning, executive function, but instead you're reaching for the phone and you're locked into uh, what the social media experts have created for you, which is a reactive experience that is triggering dopamine with the so-called intermittent variable rewards. That's what Tristan Harris calls our social media fixation. And that's why it's so addictive. It's the same as a slot machine where you don't know what you're gonna to get. That's why it's so exciting. It changes every day. Every text message is different. And so you're alert to it, you're attuned to it, and you get that dopamine hit. But that takes you away from all your best intentions of, hey, yeah, maybe I'll try a morning routine like Brad Kearns discussed, and I'll, I'll dedicate 10 minutes. But as soon as you reach for that phone, uh, stuff can easily fall apart. And same for me, same for anyone. So that's part of the picture there is I do not look at the phone, and I hit the deck. And uh, boy, it's, I, I can't say enough about it. So I'm, I appreciate you bringing that up. And um, you can look at my moves that I made on the YouTube video, but whoever you are and whatever your interests are, uh, create something that works for you. So a lot of people might just enjoy doing the yoga sun salutations and you can do six sequences and it's not too strenuous. You're not out there huffing and puffing or holding a, the most difficult move of all the yoga moves uh, if that's not of interest to you, but that's the same shape as going over the high jump bar. So I have to do my, my yoga wheel as part of my sequence, but it doesn't have to be strenuous, but it has to be something that is a pattern that can turn into a habit. 
Um, then, you know, the, the next thing I do is I take my dog outside and we have a nice adventure in the forest. And I think if you're a dog owner, you have the wonderful opportunity to honor something bigger than yourself and keep that commitment and make that a habit every day. The dog's looking at you with, with, your, with her eyes and how can, you turn, how can you turn that animal down? You owe it to the animal. So that makes for an easy habit formation. Oh, I dig it. And I have your routine right here from November 5th, 2020. And I'll put it in the show notes. Um, that's what you probably heard for one second. I pushed play on accident. Yeah, if, you, um, if you're really busy, you can look at the fast motion version and the video takes, what, 45 seconds. You can see everything I do that takes 35 minutes. So fun stuff. And then I explain everything in slower motion in case you're interested in trying some of those moves. But again, anything works as long as it's the exact same routine every morning and it really becomes habit. And by the way, I've traded, you know, I've, I've dropped stuff. Some of the stuff was hurting my knee for a while. And so I traded for a different move, but I always had a template in place, but I was, you know, able to add, 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 subtract, add, add. And that's how it's become to what it is today. Oh, good stuff. Well, I'll definitely link to that below. And that's an astonishing stat. 84% and I'm part of the 84%. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking yeah, for the world to go on without you, man. That's the thing we all need to recognize. Like, Boy, you know, you lose your phone for half a day and uh, you still live to tell about it. It's amazing. It is totally amazing. And that's partly why I like going in the backcountry very often where there is no cell service or going camping at least once a week, year round. And wow. it, oh, it's great. That's my, my hack to like recharge, take the dogs, you have two dogs. So it keeps you really grounded. Nobody can distract you. I have a, a Garmin inReach. So if my wife needs to get a hold of me or something really crazy happens, you know, on the grid, but yeah, that's been like one of my secrets to really staying grounded and present. Oh, that's a big one uh, because right now the forces are so powerful that we're really, um, we really have a challenge on our hands. Mm -hmm. And I'm really working on uh, managing my email inbox so that I can, you know, batch the answers and then go back to my peak cognitive tasks. And I have to admit right now, my grade in that is a, a D plus or maybe sometimes even worse because I'm just not, I, even though I talk about it all the time, I guess I'm not disciplined enough or I'm going for those intermittent variable rewards, the dopamine hit from my email inbox or thinking that I'm so important and so many people are counting on me that I better not be off email for an hour. So I'm still on that, you know, goal setting path to get away from that. But especially with the, uh, the mobile device, you know, we're fighting a magnificent, well, it's an opponent, which are the creators of the, uh, the apps that keep us engaged. And that's their job. And some of the brightest people in the world are very, very good at grabbing your attention and keeping it. And so it comes to the point where we're compelled to take these drastic measures, such as going outside of cell service. Otherwise, you're going to be glancing at that thing. And that's, uh, you know, it's worth considering these really uh, drastic measures to, you know, create the life that you want and maintain that uh, sense of discipline. And I found, you know, I've written a lot of books in the last uh, couple of decades, Sean, that's my main contribution to, to society. So it's a pretty big priority. We have deadlines and all that stuff. And I found some of my best work has been done sitting in the passenger seat of a car in a parking lot uh, deliberately going along for the ride with my wife while she has something to do, like go to the store or even at her office, I'll sit there for, you know, two hours uh, because I know I'm going to get work done. I'm going to be focused. I'm not going to be at home sweeping the floor or finishing up that home improvement project. And it's kind of ridiculous, but whatever works, you know, I'm out of my comfort zone and I'm in an uncomfortable zone and that gets me more focused on work. Oh, I dig it. That's very actionable. I like that. Uh, and like you, I, when I go camping, I find that that's when I'm most creative. That's when I do my write-ups or reviews or write music. And it's just, it's very nice to be off the radar just for a little bit. <laughs> it's like 12 or 14 hours once a uh, week. Once love two. it. That's awesome. Yeah, it really helps. I can make a better person for everybody. Mm. For, um, and I like back about the morning routine and the cognitive um, function. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is eat the frog first, right? Like just tackle the big project first, get it done. Uh, so you're getting the mobility out of the way and then you're ready to do the cognitive. That's a, that's a great strategy you have there. Uh, yeah. And just the first thing I said was, you know, I was hoping this thing would help me, uh, be, be better able to absorb the stress of these high intensity training sessions. And that's been the best awakening for me that um, now I have a higher platform from which to launch all formal fitness endeavors. And when I'm, 
in the age group that I am, I'm 56 years old now, um, this becomes a hugely important thing where I'm really focused on injury prevention. I just dealt with a long injury that was preventing me from sprinting and high jumping for a long time. I thought it was a bad knee. I was about to get an MRI. I was thinking I was going to have to have surgery because it was nagging me for so long. And I went to a really great physical therapist and they said, oh, dude, your, your quads are not firing correctly. They're all tightened up in this one area. So is your hip flexors. It's referring pain down to your knee. And I just tested your and it's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with your joint. And I'm like, what? You're kidding, you know, because I have knee pain every single day. Uh, so that's a plug for getting good hands on healing therapy. Uh, but secondly, you know, still with all my devotion to uh, mobility, flexibility, and all that stuff, you can still get yourself into trouble when you're, you know, pushing the body to the edge. We all know that. And that's part of the game. But boy, to, to have that kind of baseline level of fitness where now, I mean, for, I guess, decades, I woke up and the first, you know, five to 10 minutes of the day was hobbling around like an NFL player or I guess a professional triathlete. I mean, it's not a pretty picture when you're putting your body through that much kind of load and especially the impact sports like running, it takes a while for those creaky, cracky joints to get going. But now when I get up in the morning, I feel like I'm, you know, because of the previous 1000 days of doing the routine, uh, my joints feel good and I'm ready to launch into some really aggressive hamstring kicks that I probably couldn't do uh, without that, you know, momentum from doing the daily routine. I dig it. And speaking of training, and you've mentioned your podcast several times about dialing back the, the volume or the intensity uh, and training more intelligently. And you have a really good, and I, I watched this before we first did our first podcast together, and I thought you did a really good job with this, the hit versus hurt. And our friend, Dr. Craig Marker, was on before too, and we talked about this too, and Pavel talks about this. And in your words, what is the difference between hit and hurt? Yeah, good one. I, I love this interview because that's the exact related topic I was thinking of in my head where uh, I got this morning routine dialed in. Uh, of course, it's not that strenuous. It's something I can do with you know no trouble and then launch into a proper workout. But uh, going hand in hand with that is when you are out there uh, putting your body through uh, the workout protocol, uh, there's a big vote now. And I think the great leaders in the scene that we follow and respect uh, to kind of dial things back one notch and maybe come out better. And this is something that's been really hard for me to learn because when I go out there and, and you know I get my once a week opportunity to sprint, um, I'm pretty excited. I'm ready and willing to push myself. I like to set goals and time myself or try to jump over that high jump bar. So I'm pretty intense about it. And you know, the great Olympic high jumpers, uh, a lot of them say that you know you have about a dozen jumps in you, and then you're cooked. You're done. And for me, you know, I might get up to 20 or two dozen jumps, and I'm still I want to get that technique down. And so I'm going to take a few more, and I end up overdoing it, and I find out the next day like, oh, that was kind of dumb because my right calf is all lit up now. So to have this mindset that the the struggle and suffer philosophy of fitness that we've been sold uh, by marketing forces and profit seeking uh, energy uh, is really a disaster not only for uh, high level performers uh, but also the the novice probably the novice gets hurt most by this this marketing hype that you're supposed to push yourself and you see the commercial for peloton and the person's dripping with sweat and sprinting up one more hill and then high-fiving the person next to them on the other bike and it's like well you know maybe once in a while it's okay to push yourself and explore your outer limits. And that might be uh, the summer when you decide to climb the 14,000 foot peak in Colorado and you're training for it for months and months. And boy, that day is a real killer because you had to wake up at 3.15 a.m. and start and go, go, go until it got dark the next night. And then you're going to rest and recover for a long time. But if you were to do uh, one of those every weekend, then it would sort of turn that corner, cross over that line into an overly stressful exercise program. And that's essentially what uh, my career was all about as a professional triathlete traveling that much and training that much. It was a very high stress situation and it was very difficult to uh, recover and also support my health. And so those of us interested in health, longevity, having the most fun, being kind to our body, we're now opening up to great new ideas um, from people like Dr. Marker and this hit versus hurt concept. And so basically what he's talking about in that transformative article, I think it was one of the best things I've read in, you know, in this century century was that the, 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 the common uh, uh, fascination and popularity of high intensity interval training uh, can 
you know, deliver a lot of fitness benefits, but the way we usually execute these workouts uh, is flawed. And the reason is, is because the workout turns out to be exhausting and depleting. And especially a great portion of people in fitness, their number one goal is to drop excess body fat. And when you do a succession of exhausting, depleting workouts, you are triggering things like the appetite hormones and the fat storage hormones in an effort to recover from what's turning out to be an overly stressful exercise program. So you're not making any progress whatsoever on your fat loss goals. And we talk about this in detail in the book, Two Meals a Day, because we're talking about the big picture of how to, how to drop excess body fat. But with your training, pushing yourself too hard too frequently is going to cause a regression in your fitness due to injuries, breakdown, burnout, illness, uh, and it's not going to contribute to uh, body composition goals because when you stress yourself too much, you tend to uh, drift back in the direction of carbohydrate dependency eating patterns because you're exhausted and you need to replenish your depleted glycogen from the workout. So when Dr. Marker uh, described this, this new acronym, high intensity repeat training, what it means is that you perform these wonderful explosive efforts that have such a fantastic uh, benefit to your fitness. Uh, there's a lot of great science, you know, that uh, shows that these uh, brief explosive efforts have a greater contribution to fitness, body composition goals, all that stuff than workouts that last six times longer that are just a steady state cardio. Uh, so if you can perform these uh, efforts where you do a great job every single time you repeat a super high quality explosive effort, and then you're workouts over so that each of the nine uh, sprints you did are of consistent quality and they're per perform with excellent technique, excellent form, and the same sort of degree of exertion or level of perceived exertion. So you weren't digging deep for the last three that we've been socialized to think is so cool. And yeah, I was puking after the last one because I, I I took it, it, everything got you know taken out of me. All that kind of stuff is now being rethought to be ill-advised uh, because it requires extended recovery time. And it comes with an incredibly high risk of, uh, of negative stuff like an injury or just a, a delayed recovery. And so one of the signs for those listening at home is muscle soreness. Raise your hand if you get sore after workouts a lot. And that the idea is that when you get sore after a workout, your protein synthesis now has to be dedicated to repairing the damaged muscles as indicated by the soreness, rather than uh, contributing to strengthening or growing those muscles if that's your goal, or just getting them more toned and more uh, explosive, uh, not necessarily growing them, but just getting stronger, faster, more explosive. But if you're repairing muscle damage, you're diverting your energy and your resources to that goal until you can repair the soreness. And therefore, you, you kind of progress at a uh, a more haphazard and slower rate than if you were to always keep things under control and then build, build, build upon that where yes, a year from now, two years from now, your workouts are much more badass. You're going faster on your repeats, all that stuff, but it's still not taxing you in the way that we're, you know, convinced is the way to go is to just, you know, struggle and suffer and then somehow emerge with uh, a higher level of fitness. Oh, Brad nailed it. I'm so happy we're talking about this. It's so great to see you uh, over there talking in this language. And I learned this language from uh, Pavel. Uh, Grease the groove, man. Grease the groove. Exactly. And uh, he had a seminar called Strong Endurance and Dr. Craig Marker presented and went through a lot of the science of why this works. And that was in 2017. And to, to validate what Brad is saying, in my own personal fitness, as well as when I'm training my students, we do this kind of training. And at first it might not seem like enough, but it totally works very effectively. You can measure it. You can get as nerdy as you want with uh, accelerometers, like push bands and stuff. And you can see where you level off with wattage and stuff if you really care. Mm -hmm. that or you can just wow. perceive exertion. And it, it, we do it in group classes and it can be with kettlebells, it can be sprinting with like what Brad does. It can be body weight. It, it, it's, I won't go into too much detail, so I'm sure you'll talk about it in the book. Um, it works fantastically. I'm an advocate for it, and I'm glad you are too. Well, here's another thing. In, in case you're skeptical and you feel like you, you need to push yourself and get sore to get workout benefits, um, the great uh, champions in every sport honor these principles where they're training almost all the time under total control and well within their resources and their limits. Um, one of the great examples was the legendary marathon runner, 
uh, Yuliad Kipchoge. He's uh, widely regarded as the greatest uh, distance runner that's ever been on the earth. The guy is an absolute phenom. He's the one who did that one hour and 59 minute marathon, which no one ever thought uh, the human could, could run under two hours. Uh, he won the Olympics. He's won the world championships. He was almost undefeated and had this amazing career starting on the running track at shorter events. So this guy is the, the pinnacle of the human performance in running. And he published his training log on the internet a few years ago for all those to scrutinize heavily. And of course they did. And the exercise physiologist went out there and did some complex calculations and there's follow-up articles that you can read. But the, the essential message here is that this guy trains uh, at a comfortable pace for almost all of his training. Uh, many of his miles, and he runs about 120 to 130 miles per week with no tapering, even before championship events, which is a mind blower because we all know how if you slow down and back off your training, you're going to have a burst. But he doesn't need to taper because he's like a machine running along, you know, starting up the, the race car and doing a few laps around the track every day. And then uh, the Indy 500 is the next morning. So your, your car is doing great. Uh, that, that's kind of the level that he's at. But a lot of his running is at or around. 80% of his maximum heart rate. And this aligns with the message that we talk about a lot in Primal Endurance and Dr. Phil Maffetone talking about the MAF heart rate, where you're burning mostly fat and staying away from those sugar burning heart rates, which when you're doing cardio can really uh, lead you down a path of overtraining and, and, and breakdown. So here's the greatest marathon runner of all time, who's apparently, if you watched him work out, you would be blown away at how fast he runs and how amazing these workout sets are. But guess what? The guy is in another uh, time zone. And so we have to only look at the relative exertion that he's facing and apply that to uh, what you're doing with your workout. And so the vast majority of runners in the United States of America who are running slower than four hour marathon, four hours is like top 10% of the finishers in Los Angeles marathon, New York City marathon. So most runners out there should be jog walkers if they wanted to honor the great example set by the greatest runner of all time. So in other words, most of us out there uh, running, the, running the roads and trails of the world are pushing ourselves harder than Kipchoge pushes himself. <laughs> and you know, to the, to the great detriment of massive injury rates, massive attrition rates in these uh, extreme endurance sports, the ultra running. And that's something that hopefully will be a wake up call uh, for, for all of us. And there's great examples in the other sports, the swimmers that, that perform in the Olympics are swimming for hours and hours a day, but everything's under control. They're not getting out of the water with their deltoids, you know, throbbing from the intensity of pushing themselves too hard in the water. They're always under control and then allowed to build without interruption. And yeah, maybe it takes 10 years or 15 years to get to Olympic gold. But for our purposes, we just want to be healthy, happy. We want to have energy to play with our kids at the park after our workout in the morning. So almost everybody listening, great idea to just back it off a notch and then let the benefits accrue in a natural manner. Oh, nailed it. I love it. Um, I so agree with that. Um, when I was talking with our mutual friend now, Eric Frohart, um, the first meeting we had, we were talking about training and uh, effort. And one of the lines we came up with was, we always leave a little bit on in the gym or leave a, leave a run on the mountain. Just leave <laughs> yeah, especially if you're a Navy SEAL, man. If you're going on a mission and you, you went too hard climbing the mountain the day before, you're gonna get, you're gonna get hosed. I mean, that's, that's a life or death matter in some cases. Absolutely. And Eric uh, is a great, great guy. He's been on your podcast, uh, been on our podcast. He's retired Navy SEAL, Purple Heart recipient, just a wonderful person. And um, yeah, so take it from, from Eric Frohart. <laughs> this stuff really works. Tra train smart, train intelligent. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, that may lend to more consistency. It, it does. Because you're not so averse to heading to the gym because you know it's going to be another torture fest with your personal trainer who believes that to collect the, the fee for the hour, that they have to be kind of a, a, a slave driver and a coach and come on, one more, you know, one more set, you can do it and all that kind of stuff. Now, we're talking to a certain segment of the audience that's listening to this show, probably a very devoted health and fitness enthusiast. And so we also have to address the, the big problem of uh, people who are not active enough in general. So there's a certain amount 
amount of people that should get up off their butt and move their body and put their body under more resistance load and all those great things. But I do see this huge problem of people going from zero to 60 too quickly and it's unsustainable. So if we could all kind of embrace the power of getting those dogs out for a walk for 15 minutes every day and realizing that that can be a huge improvement to your health and fitness, I think people kind of discount anything that you know doesn't earn you a gold star at the gym and uh, the high fives and the sweaty bodies after the workout. I have this great uh, association with the company called Carol Fit and they have a stationary bike. It's a, uh, a artificial intelligence bike. So it learns what resistance to apply to you based on the previous workouts of how, uh, how your fitness level is. Uh, but if you can look on their website, they promote an eight minute workout on the stationary bike. That's it, eight minutes. And the guy on their homepage is wearing a suit, uh, implying that you don't even sweat after eight minutes. But with this eight minute training protocol, you uh, include uh, maximum all-out sprints, two 20-second all-out sprints. And so you're getting these incredible metabolic and hormonal benefits from a very, very short workout that does not bring that high risk of overtraining that happens when you're going to spin class for an hour, four or five days a week, and just getting into that uh, chronic overproduction of stress hormones and dysfunctional uh, metabolism, increased appetite, all that stuff that happens when you're out there for too long, pushing yourself too hard. Makes sense. And I want to add on to this too. This kind of training plays well with your sport. So for me, it's, I go in the mountains probably two or three times a week and go on that split board right there and go up the mountain. And this kind of training doesn't take away from that. I don't, you know, I'm not bonked, I'm not crapped out. I'm ready to go. My mitochondria is happy. And also I want to ask your, your opinion on this. A lot of the people I associate with in the mountains here in Colorado, we exercise, we backcountry ski or snowshoe or split board in temperatures of like negative five to maybe 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Whew. Yeah. And I love it. It's brisk, right? Not quite as brisk as your ice bath, but it's, it's nice and cold. What is your theory on like brown fat and mitochondria and exercising in colder temperatures? Oh, that's a good one. And I have done some research because I'm so fond of my morning uh, cold exposure the regimen either in the chest freezer or here in the winter time in Lake Tahoe, I just go to the lake. The lake's now at 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'll go for a quick swim in the lake and get out. And we know from the research and you've seen some articles that in my opinion are a little bit uh, jumping the gun and a little bit hyped up because it says uh, you get cold, you activate brown fat, and the brown fat, the brown fat's kind of fat that keeps you warm. It's not like body fat that you burn. So there's a different type of fat on the body. Uh, but when you activate brown fat and you're trying to keep warm, uh, it raises your metabolic rate and you burn more fat and you lose weight. Yeah, okay. This is all uh, valid, uh, but we forgot the compensatory response by the body. And when the body is working hard to get back to homeostasis and burning more calories, trying to rewarm back to present body, to, to healthy body temperature, we also are going to experience a reliable increase in appetite. And so anyone can relate if you've been out there uh, chopping wood in the snow or skiing all day or getting yourself slightly cold for a long period of time or extremely cold for a short period of time, like jumping in the cold plunge, um, you're going to get an appetite spike and you're going to consume more calories in the process of uh, trying to rewarm. So uh, I feel like there's a strategy here if you're interested in reducing excess body fat, which a lot of people are, uh, and the strategy is to engage in therapeutic cold exposure, not extreme cold exposure, because extreme cold exposure, you're going to slow down your metabolic rate in order to survive like a bear hibernating, right? So if we do this therapeutic cold exposure and we kind of ignore that appetite spike for a while so we can hold out maybe for a couple few hours after our plunge into the cold lake or the cold tub, that's when your fat burning is going crazy. You're getting this huge spike and then you're you know, finally getting your um, body temperature back to normal. And that can be a huge catalyst for, uh, for fat loss, uh, independent of all the efforts you make with your uh, diet changes and exercise. And this is important because uh, a lot of the science is now showing when it comes to weight loss that our notion that it's about calories in, calories out is totally flawed. Um, Jason Fung in the Obesity Code does a great job uh, citing a lot of science uh, showing that the calories that you burn during exercise are completely uh, compensated for by increased appetite, 
increased caloric expenditure and decreased activity, more laziness in the hours after your workout. So if you're one of those gym rats that goes to the 6 a.m. boot camp class five days a week, hoping that you're going to lose weight, what actually happens is you burn those calories during the workout. And then the rest of the day, you find ways subconsciously and consciously to be lazier and to eat more food. And so it's a, it's a net zero at the end of the day. And that's pretty fascinating because it kind of throws uh, out the window a lot of these principles and these beliefs that we've acted upon uh, as you know healthy fitness enthusiasts trying to watch our portion sizes and put in a few more extra miles in order to get leaner for the big competition ahead. And the body doesn't really work that way. So I'm, I'm thinking that I like to call it this under the radar strategy. It kind of aligns with the the grease the groove concepts and the micro workouts concepts that we're talking about, but uh, doing things that don't uh, prompt this huge compensatory response, but help you burn a little bit more fat off your body that you don't want there. And I think that's the winning formula to you know get that final five, 10 or 20 pounds off your body and then keep it off for the rest of your life is you're throwing in these micro workouts. You're leading an overall active lifestyle where it's no big deal to take the dog out for another 15 minute walk. You're not just sitting for hours and hours and hours. You're engaging in things like therapeutic cold exposure, therapeutic heat exposure, and doing these little um, hormetic stressors, they call them, right? Where you're doing a, a brief appropriate stressor that has a positive adaptive benefit in the long run, but it's nothing too extreme and too overwhelming. Same with those workouts that get you sore and exhausted. You're just going to be sitting around eating more food in the two, three or four days afterwards. So it's not, it's not even worth thinking about as a positive thing. It's mostly, it's mostly against all the stated goals that you've had written down for why you're working out. Oh, that's great. And I, um, you sent over an advanced copy of the two meals a day book and I'm really enjoying it. And I love how you guys go into talking about it's not just calories in calories out. It's not, there's hormones behind it. There's the adaptations. There's, there's so much more to it. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit about the book. So what, what led you and Mark to write another book? Uh, because we were absolutely certain that after the last, uh, I think the seventh or eighth book that we've been uh, cranking through in the last decade, we were sure that we had nothing else to say. And this was it. And you can just go back and look at the library and get all the all your needs met and all the knowledge that you need. But then, as it turns out, there always seems to be something more to say. And I think the the more to say on this one is to cut through the controversy and confusion that we're now facing uh, as we you know, escalate our transfer of information and the ability to uh, communicate with big audiences and, and people get on their platform. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion. I know this from relating to everyday people that are not in the scene like you and I, but my high school buddies, let's say, and we get together and they're saying, so, so BK, uh, you got a new book coming out. What, what's going on? What's it all about? Is this healthy? Is my nachos okay? Can I eat those? You know, this kind of thing where people are busy doing other things with their daily life. They don't have time to scrutinize all the latest research and data and they're getting manipulated by uh, propaganda like the Game Changers. No offense to the Game Changers, but it is a propaganda film. It's not a scientific film or a documentary in the true sense of that word. Uh, but yeah, it's tough out there. It's a real battle, uh, especially for someone who wants to be healthy, but does not <laughs> is not willing to devote four hours a day to research, right? So we want to write a book that kind of uh, rose above the nitpicking and the obsessive tracking of macronutrients for those interested in that, good for them. Uh, but for most of us, we're just trying to get through the day, get our kids off to homeschool in the other room, get some work done in our room, right? The whole thing that we're facing uh, in modern times. And so this title, Two Meals a Day, I think is a good starting point because it conveys the idea that when you eat is just as important as what you eat. And our big problem today uh, is this chronic overproduction of insulin, hyperinsulinemia that leads to metabolic syndrome. This is undisputed. This is not just Brad talking, but uh, it's believed to be widely regarded to be the number one health problem facing uh, the developed world uh, is this metabolic syndrome. It's a collection of disease factors that lead to type two diabetes, obesity, cancer, heart disease. And it's all uh, the root cause is this high insulin producing diet that's high in processed foods uh, 
otherwise known as the standard American diet, the grain-based high carbohydrate diet. So a lot of stuff we're eating is uh, devoid of nutrition. It does not satiate us. It throws off our appetite hormones, causing us to eat more and more every single day and render our fat cells uh, you know, uh, trapped in storage instead of easily accessed and burned, which is the ancestral example of how humans have evolved. And so what we want to do is kind of hit these big picture points that are undisputed and that will work and be simple and doable and sustainable for everybody, even someone who's not extremely into uh, dietary practices. So if you can envision this goal of eating less frequently, and then secondly, enjoying your meals and not depriving yourself, because as I just stated with the, uh, the, the emerging science showing that if you just if you cut back on calories, your body's just going to slow down and compensate. If you burn more energy with crazy workouts, your body's going to slow down and compensate and eat more food. So the idea is just uh, get really good at fasting. Because when you're in a fasted state, that's when your body works most effectively. Uh, that's when cell repair is optimized. That's when immune function is optimized. That's when your anti-inflammatory processes are optimized and you're burning fat, you're feeling good and you have to do some hard work to get there. Uh, the main thing is to ditch these modern processed foods. So if we can just ditch the crappy foods, eat less frequently, we are on our way to a wonderful explosion in health and increased longevity. Uh, that's great. And you, there's a great checklist of things to go through, like an audit in your home and, and take out things and, and why to take those things out and why to include new things. And um, I'm a little plug for you. Send over ancestral supplements right here. So uh, I love the idea of eating really clean uh, food, big time. Yeah. I mean, what happens when you sit down to a truly nutritious and satisfying meal is that your brain and your, your cells on the deepest level have been completely satisfied and satiated. And so that will align you with uh, whatever eating goals and, and clean eating goals that you have because you are treating yourself to these wonderful nutrient-dense meals. Um, and a lot of people have never experienced that because there's so much crap in their diet that they're not attuned to their appetite and satiety signals. And they're just kind of uh, mowing down carbohydrates as their primary source of energy, uh, a lot of them nutrient deficient. So if you envision this pie chart of all the different foods you eat and a huge chunk of them are not providing any nutritional value, you're gonna be prompted to continue to consume more calories than you need because you can't burn fat and you haven't truly obtained the nutrition that your your genes are craving deep down. Um, the commercials in the old days for Lay's potato chips and Pringles, bet you can't eat just one, that's how the jingle went. And it's true because they've uh, sprinkled in chemicals and things that they are, are known to stimulate appetite and they're not giving you anything except for a quick hit of uh, incredible flavor intensity that has the uh, addictive, um, effect to where you're just going to be locked into these uh, nutrient deficient foods. And look, I'm not some uh, Mr. Clean here up in the ivory tower. When I was a kid, I ate all kinds of crap and I live really close to this, uh, this candy store. And so we'd walk down there and shove all kinds of stuff down our mouth. And, you know, I wasn't into nutrition until I got a little older and I was the hot fudge Sunday King. No one could top me. I'd take these pictures with all the different stuff on there. Uh, but it's easy for any one of us to dehabituate away from these habits that have been in there for a long time, where we feel like dessert comes after dinner. And when you're at a restaurant, the person comes with a big smile. Can I tempt you to one of the things on our plate? So, you know, we have these cultural mainstays of things like dessert. And uh, it's, you know, if you've had a fantastic meal with the best steak you've ever had and a delicious sweet potato and broccoli or whatever you like to consume, uh, you're, you're just fine. And if you're not, then have another steak. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're trying to load up on the nutritious foods because it's difficult to overconsume those because they're so satisfying compared to the potato chips. Have you ever stuffed yourself too full on too many steaks or too many nice cuts of salmon uh, with the skin on and enjoying every single bite? It's, it's almost impossible because the brain says, that was great. I'm good. I'm satisfied. And um, I'm ready to live a healthy life. I'm with you. Yeah, Saturday night, I was actually, I had salmon and a steak and I couldn't finish them. I was like, <laughs> that was so delicious. But you're right. Um, is it uh, ghrelin or leptin? I forget that uh, satiation. 
uh, well, ghrelin is the prominent hunger hormone, so it, it spikes your appetite. And then leptin is uh, primarily responsible for reproductive function. That's its base function is to, to make you fit for reproduction. And so it will determine whether or not to burn fat or store it and also uh, contribute to your satiety. So if you're starving, uh, leptin uh, signaling is going to be very prominent and you're going to be commanded to, to stuff your face, uh, such as the people who participated in the Biggest Loser uh, TV show for six weeks, their leptin is going to be uh, signaling them to overeat for months and months on end afterward because they've been through such an ordeal and a starvation experience. And that's how to recalibrate is the body wants to uh, replenish and re-nurse. That's why I talked about those overly stressful workout patterns will just spike those appetite hormones and the satiety hormones will be directed toward fat storage rather than fat burning because you got to recover from, you know, imagine if you're trying to break the record on the Appalachian Trail uh, where the, the ultra endurance runners go, you know, 39 and a half days is the new record, meaning they covered 47.5 miles per day over this incredible terrain. Um, you know, that's an extreme experience where that person is probably going to, you know, be replenishing calories for months on end afterward uh, due to the, you know, due to the extreme nature of it. But for most of us, we got to get through the day feeling well nourished and satisfied. And we're, we're getting in the way of that with the these portion control diets and these extreme exercise patterns. Uh, uh, yeah, well stated, well stated. And I've only read uh, about a quarter of the book so far, and you, you guys covered this in great detail. It's very actionable. And um, I was actually recommending the book to my, my mother-in-law because she was asking about how to implement these nice new habits and, and get away from the carbohydrates and the sugars. And, you know, uh, so your book is the first thing I'm going to give to her. Um, you got great accolades from a lot of people on this book. Uh, praises for the two meal, two meals a day. Um, Melissa Urban, uh, can you speak about her for a second? Oh my gosh, what she's done with Whole30. Uh, Mark, Mark Sisson and I have been huge fans of hers from the very beginning. And the way that she created that template as an entry point, and you hear people talking like, well, I tried the Whole30. And so to have a, a really directed approach to changing your life, is really important. And she's done that better than anybody, really. I mean, that that program is, you know, widely popular. And then from there, after a 30 day uh, period of devoted restriction of the foods that have been compromising your health for decades prior, then you're teed up for, you know, amazing continued success and lifelong adherence because you feel great. I don't know if there's too many whole 30 dropouts that say this thing sucked and I was tired and uh, I, I wanted to go back to my ice cream. It's just not the way the body works and you get immediate positive feedback. So uh, all, all the people that are making these great efforts, it's really nice. And, um, you know, I'm an economics uh, uh, major in college, uh, not not health sciences, right? So uh, my expertise is like in athletic experience and, you know, being part of the uh, being part of the journey and sharing information and telling stories and writing books. Uh, but going back to my economics uh, studies, uh, there's a concept called the economic theory of abundance, where the more uh, entities are talking about and promoting similar thing, uh, the rising tide floats all boats. And we're fighting this battle against, you know, mainstream medical science, the large uh, food manufacturing conglomerates of the planet, uh, spitting out this nasty, disgusting uh, food products. Uh, Michael Pollan calls them edible food-like substances rather than food. And so I'm all about, you know, promoting everyone who's doing great work. It's all a community effort here. So yeah, thanks for asking me to give a plug. And same with, uh, you know, Rob Wolf and all the other names that have come up in this show, Pavel, uh, Eric Frohart, we're all doing great work and fighting that battle against people who are still dispensing irresponsible and, you know, information that's, that's dead wrong, uh, that's manipulative. And we got to uh, sort through that and, you know, fight this battle hard, just like we were talking about at the start of the show, call things out that are bullshit and lead people into, you know, a, a place where they can be confident with their own decisions. Absolutely. Well stated. Um, and that, that's a great ending point right here. And it's great because you're speaking the language. Uh, uh, Gabriel Reese <laughs> gives you a shout out here. Like if we can get more people to have these great positive influences to speak in this similar language to help affect people positively, we really can make a big, huge change. So yeah, you're right, Sean. It takes, uh, it takes some patience mm -hmm. and it takes being receptive to the message. And I know I've, uh, 
kind of aired in the past, sharing my incredible enthusiasm and depth of knowledge to people that weren't really ready to listen. And so now I'm just wasting my own breath. I might as well put a mirror in front of my face and talk to myself. And so I think there's that balance point that we have to uh, wait for our opportunities and then take advantage of them, but not kind of overwhelm people and make them feel bad and, and deficient. And if they're not, you know, at the same heightened level of health awareness as, uh, as the person who's uh, sharing the message. So I am all in favor of a kinder, gentler approach. Uh, but if someone asks me, hey, what did you think of that, that Game Changers? I'll say, well, it was largely propaganda. And Chris Kresser spent three hours on Joe Rogan podcast, painstakingly uh, picking apart almost every single scene in the movie with charts and graphs and scientific research. So if you're going to sit and watch uh, a show like that, go watch uh, the follow-up podcast with Chris Kresser so you can get uh, your mind uh, set straight. I can appreciate that. And you're right. I have friends who have watched that and like, then they get on their high horse and I'm like, don't preach to me. <laughs> I'm glad you found entertainment or something out of that. That's fine. Uh, but yeah, my colleagues at our gym went through and they made a video as well going through like, all right, let's talk about this open-mindedly and like, you know, make up your own mind, but here's some more information for you to use. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. I, I dig it. Well, you have so many endeavors. I'm going to try and encapsulate them all. So if you'd like to learn more about Brad, you can go to his website. I'll have links below for that, um, uh, bradkearns.com. And then, of course, the B-Rad podcast, which is fantastic. You have great guests, and you guys get into some great topics. And that was I Pushed Play on Accident for it. I recognize that song. Wait a sec. That was the Day in the Life video. Yeah. I'll have a link to the, the morning routine uh, right there for Brad Kearns right there. And then... Uh, we will have a link when the book does come out. Is it March 9th the book comes out? Yeah, you can pre-order this book two meals a day right now. And I really appreciate that plug uh, about your mother-in-law because we also had the intention with this book of uh, talking to the people that have been following along for a long time. There's going to get some great new information. There's a whole chapter on advanced strategies for fat reduction where I talk about some of that uh, cold exposure that we got to on the show briefly. But it's also a great book to hand to someone who's new to the game and wants a really easy read right? You know, like I'm, I'm trying to write at the level of uh, someone who's not living and breathing this stuff. So I'm not trying to impress people with big words. And we're always trying to explain these concepts so that uh, they're embraceable and not be too heavy handed or too dogmatic. So I think it's a great book to give to someone that uh, cares about their health and wants to do more and, and something that's really doable and sustainable. Absolutely. And oh, yeah. So you can go to this uh, website, two meals a day book.com, T W O meals a day book.com. And we have these great uh, pre order incentives. So if you pre order the book now on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever you like to go, you go back to the website, you put in your receipt, and um, you get uh, an audio summary, you get a PDF of recipes, you get $10 off for shopping at Primal Kitchen for healthy products. And we just want to encourage everybody to, to jump on board and uh, enjoy this book uh, right now, all the way up to release date. That's fantastic. And in Primal Kitchen, if you guys don't know, my wife and I like every condiment and love her. We do have frozen meals. Our Primal Kitchen meals are fantastic. Avocado oil, it's legit. Um, and then also Brad makes the best snack. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece for those watching on YouTube. Yes, it's now on Amazon, Sean. So pretty easy to order. Uh, and grab yourself a jar of the best nut butter on the planet. It's a blend of macadamia, walnut, cashew, coconut butter, cacao nibs. And I just had fun fooling around with this in my kitchen and was giving out little jars to people. And just like the old story goes with the, you know, on the back of the potato chip bag or wherever the person says, people told me I should uh, bring this to market. So I'm trying to make a healthy uh, you know, snack or treat item that's, you can feel a uh, guiltless pleasure of really, really consuming a superfood with all the nutrition in there. And, you know, see if you see what you think. It's, it's well received by everyone who's tried it. So that's cool. I love your copywriting too. Your your way you word things is fantastic. <laughs> Reward winning taste. That's that's clever. Yeah. If you if you want a food product without a sense of humor anywhere visible on the label, you gotta find someone else because I'm always trying to get clever and I like when I buy stuff that, you know, you can get a little sense of the personality uh, and people having a little bit of fun with stuff because we've been hit with so much, you know, hype and uh, self aggrandizing statements. So I'm I'm trying to keep it real. Same with the B Rad podcast. Uh, you know, the the motto here is to have a little bit of a sense of humor, uh, keep things fun and, and lively and also 
dispense the proper information for living healthy and avoiding disease and all those serious topics. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a great podcast. Um, I'll link to all this below. Brad, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights and inspiration. Uh, looking forward to the next time get chat with you. Oh, Sean, I so enjoy connecting with you and uh, the, the best voice and the best background of any uh, podcast host on the planet. So be sure to watch on YouTube and um, you're, you're doing great stuff. I love the reviews and all that. So and keep camping. That is that is a great, uh, great model there. Get out there and enjoy nature every week. Yeah, luckily you're up in Tahoe. I, I know Tahoe pretty well. It's very pretty. So you're right doing- on. Hey, man. Yeah. Awesome. OnlyGamer.com followers, listeners, readers, viewers, fans, you will find this on YouTube, Spotify, everywhere else you can listen or view. And uh, until next time, take care.